Um, right, um, this evening we will have a nice sit back. It's too hot, so we'll just sit back and relax and do everything slowly and quietly. Right. If anybody starts sleeping and snoring, it's fully understood. <laughs> okay, <laughs> because quite frankly, I would love to curl up with a whiskey and so forth. Um, and, uh, it, it's always going to be Some of the things that I'm going to tackle tonight about turn, I have already tackled before in a demonstration here a couple of years ago. Um, so there'll be a repeat of some of the things that some people have already seen, but some of the new members will not have seen them. Uh, and I think they're extremely important anyway. The setup for this evening is that I will do a bit of talking, a bit of demonstrating, and so forth for the first third or so of the evening. And then later on, um, there's an exercise that we can, we can all do to do with uh, the return. But there are just one or two things I want to point out that are very, very important, and which I've learned along the artistic road, and which sometimes I forget, and which I see uh, sometimes um, members here perhaps forget. Um, and not just to do with tone, but other bits and pieces too. And so I'll bring those in at the same time. It'll be a bit of a mishmash. Okay. Um, but tone, I feel, after all my experience, the, the look, looking at tone, exploring it and so forth, is far more important than virtually any other element in artwork. It's more important than the choice of colour. If you look at some of the paintings by Andy Warhol and others and so forth, um, the colours there, there's nothing like the real colours at all, they're doing portraits or whatever. But what actually does, um, uh, is important, is the way that colours are used in their tonal sense. I'll be using language tonight, which um, I'll try and explain because it gets a little bit technical here and there. Um, I've given you a handout, I've given you a grey scale as well. We'll use that a little later on. The handout we can refer to tonight, but it's also for you to take away so that you can um, refer to it um, as and when you want to in your own work. The important thing when we're exhibiting is that our paintings should have impact. And tone has a lot to do with impact. If you've got somebody coming in to the exhibition in a couple of weeks' time, they look around and you want your painting to grab their attention from the other side of the room and hold their attention as they walk towards it. And in fact, so it competes against everybody and everything else. It's, it's so impactful, it's not an actual word, but there's so much impact in it that that's where they want to be, where they want to go. And very often that impact, it doesn't matter what the subject is, comes through light and dark differences. It comes through this thing I constantly talk about of capturing the light. If you do not capture the light in your paintings, then you're onto a loser. And we capture light very easily, simply by surrounding it by dark. And in fact, if you look, I think it's on page three, I'll jump around in this a little bit. There's a portrait by Rembrandt at the bottom there. Now, I apologize again, my printer wasn't working that well. The, the left-hand image is the original, uh, with the dark around it. The right-hand image is the same image, basically, but with the dark removed and with a medium tone put beside it. Now, it doesn't come out so well on this, this print, but if you sort of close your eyes and then look again very quickly and don't try to think of it as a portrait, hopefully you'll find that the image, the original image on the, the left-hand side has a great deal more impact. The tones that Rembrandt has used for this guy's face are actually sort of medium tones, they're middle tones, middle values as, as we call them, uh, which by themselves just don't have much impact at all. But what he's done is he's surrounded the whole portrait in black. And all of a sudden, those medium tones zing. They really come out. As I say, this is, from a, this is a print onto a print onto a print and so forth. If you look at the original, it's really, really impactful. It looks as though complete light coming onto this guy's face. If you remove that dark area, you don't capture the light, and the impact is not quite so, so much. Okay. So with tone, we're looking at values. We're looking at values which are very, very, from very, very dense 
through to the very, very light. And if you look at the first page again, this little, little graph there, if you like, colour graph, which shows you three, uh, six or seven colours with their deepest tones at the top and their lightest tones at the bottom and the various grades going through. So with one colour, what we call a hue, H-U-E, you can have several different tones of that one colour going through. And as artists, it's being able to use those tones in the right way and in the right place that helps our paintings to have impact. And we'll show you that, how that works tonight. Okay, so I, I, I'll keep on emphasising that because so often I find paintings which have been beautifully drawn and, and nicely painted, but where all the colours are sort of what I would call medium tone. And if you look at the final page at the top, at that painting of the house with trees around and so forth, that's the kind of thing that sometimes gets painted by a lot of you know, um, landscape artists and so forth who are on the road to learning, where virtually all the tones there are sort of middle tones. There's no real differentiations. Different colours used there, different greens and yellows and uh, raw sienas and so forth, but there's no impact. Now I've got that painting here, and I'll, as part of the introduction tonight, I'll change it. I'll give it some impact. Because you can go back to past paintings that you've done and, and change them, which is quite nice. Um, and of course the other thing I'd like to say is that uh, what I'm talking about tonight is the same, doesn't matter what medium you're using, whether it's uh, watercolour or oil or acrylic and so forth, they're all the same. Um, on the second page there, um, there are one or two other terms, and you can refer to these later on. Um, chroma, not the place in Norfolk, but C-H-R-O-M-A, it's quite important. And it goes along with the diagram on the third page there at the top. The tonal range, which there's, on the third page, there's um, one, two, seven or so um, colours, starting with indigo at the top, then sepia, pyrrole red, and so forth. Over the right-hand side, there are the darkest tones you can get with those colours. But, if you look at the darkest tone you can get with yellow ochre, it's roughly halfway along the indigo trail. Does everybody really understand that? Your lemon yellows, your yellow ochres, and so forth, you cannot get intense tones with them. The thicker the, as thick as you make them, you, that's as far as you go. Whereas other colours, like indigo and sepia and so forth, the tonal range is much, much wider. And that should um, come into your choice of colours. If you want deep colours, deep tones, then choosing a colour or colours which have a wide range is quite important. Um, and that comes down to the chroma. So chroma basically means the intensity of the particular hue or colour that you've got. So indigo has a very high chroma value, very, very intense, whereas lemon yellow has quite a low chroma value, and therefore it's the range of tones you can get with a lemon yellow is a lot less than it is uh, with indigo. So okay? I find, the more I get into this business of art, um, the more I find it's a cerebral occupation, in other words, it's an occupation of the brain, which is one of the reasons why it's nice to have that quiet period at the beginning, you know, the first hour that we're here. Because what you should be doing, what I should be hearing, is your brain's humming away, <laughs> overheating perhaps, and saying constantly, am I light enough? Am I dark enough? Have I got enough contrast there? How can I arrange this painting so that I get impact? And so when I'm painting, and when I'm drawing, especially when I'm drawing, this is why it's so important to draw freehand rather than get into a bad habit perhaps of, of drawing um, using a quick process like um, carbon transfer and so forth. When I'm drawing, I'm constantly looking for areas which I can leave out and leave completely light and other areas beside them where they, I can leave put in darks. And it's by doing that and getting that, that, capturing that light that I can actually get some, some impact into my painting, hopefully. So that is 
I, that's what I find, that there's a lot of thought that has to go in before you start painting. Um, and then hopefully when you've painted, this is what Rembo, was it Paul, what's his talks a couple of years ago, said, a couple of years ago, that you plan your painting like a tortoise, but you paint it like a hare. Once you've made your decisions about tone and everything else, the actual painting of it should take minutes. Not, you know, a long length of time, because you've made those decisions. If you're having to think whilst you're painting about oh, you know, whatever, then um, those are decisions perhaps you should have made right at the, right at the beginning. Uh, and this is a, uh, just to show you this thing about impact and capturing light. This is something which a lot of you have seen before, but some of you haven't, so I'll, I'll show it again. What we've got up here is the lightest light. And down here, we've got the darkest dark. So this is a light field, and on it, there is a light cottage. And this is a dark field, and on it, there's a dark cottage. If you look at it, the cottage has virtually disappeared in the light area, and again down here in the dark area. If I now take a cottage with a middle tone, like that, Oops. I've now got a darker tone against the light. And it's therefore showing up. And I've got a lighter tone against the dark, and therefore it's showing up. If I change the tone a little bit further, against the light, it's really beginning to stand out. But against the darker tone, it's not. So when you're deciding, you know, one, of the, one of the most wonderful things you can, you can do is, and, and it's quite simple, cottages, fine. Trees behind them. Wonderful. If you make the trees dark, then the dark will contrast with the light of the roof or whatever, and you start to get this impact. But the photograph you're working from may not show that. It may show you the trees with branches with and twigs, and all the greenery is gone because it's winter or whatever. But is that going to be the right way to paint it? Don't just do what the photograph says. Change things to give you yourself impact. And of course, if we go to the absolute extreme, let's swap these round. You've now got the lightest light against the darkest dark. And you've just got the darkest dark against the lightest light. And therefore, you get maximum impact. Okay? That's very, very important. I, I can't, you know, that's, that's been more important to me, realising that, <clears throat> than anything else in, in uh, choosing colours and tones and so forth. Changing the, 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 uh, the tones, so that I start to get, I can, I can use the different tones, for instance, if I had a, a nighttime scene here, and of course the, the, this would be a little bit darker as well, but a nighttime scene, or for hills, or, or, or um, hills or whatever, to help me make this shape here come out more by making it light. Okay. Is everybody happy with that? Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. Now, um, we're going to... I, yeah, I gave you um, um, this uh, strip. This is quite useful. You can get these strips for all sorts of colours. We just make them up ourselves. Um, it can be quite useful to determine tone. I think it's all been really rough, as you can see, so it's all coming apart. Um, but for instance, if I was going to paint an apple, then I can put that beside it, and it helps me to choose which tones I'm going to use. So right at the top, you know, where we've got the light shining on the top, I can move that strip along until I find out which tone it is. All right. it, obviously it's getting closer to the, the low tone, the low value tone. But coming down here is coming to perhaps a, a middle tone, and right at the bottom it's a very, very dark tone. Now that's, you know, that sounds pretty obvious. It's quite useful to have these strips. You often find artists using them to choose when they look, especially if they're doing um, uh, you know, a, a, an object on a table or whatever, to choose which tones that they, they should use. Okay. And the thing that I'd like to point out is that, of course, when we're looking at um, a three-dimensional object, is that wherever it's sitting, you're going to have a shadow because you've got light cast on it and so forth. 
but there are always two shadows. Do you all know that? Two shadows. From a single light force, uh, at light, there's always two shadows. You get the ordinary shadow, which we're all used to, but you also get what we call the proximity shadow. And the proximity shadow, and it really does help your, your painting. So there's the apple. There's some darker tones coming down there. Right? Yeah, sorry. Don't fix the camera as well. There's the shadow, the ordinary shadow, cast by light coming from over here. But can you see right the way down there, there's a, just a little dark area. Okay. That's what we call the proximity shadow. And it's usually the same colour that we've got for the main shadow, but it's much, much stickier. Much, much deeper. Right? And it just plants the object onto the surface. If you put your hand on top of the table and have a look, you'll see this. The shadow's been cast by the light, but right the way in there, there's a very, very, very dark shadow. And that's the same for virtually any object. So, uh, a house or anything that's sitting on the ground, you'll have these proximity shadows to the same, the same area too. Okay. That's very important. What I'm trying to give you is, is some ideas about impact, about making your work look that little bit more realistic, if you like, if that's what you're, you're, you're trying to achieve. And remember, at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is to create the three-dimensional effect on a two-dimensional piece of paper. Keep that in mind. What do I need to do to change something so that I'm using three-dimensional gizmos, if you like, um, to create that three-dimensional effect on a 2D piece of paper? And it's those shadows, not just the one shadow, but the proximity shadow, um, that's important. Now, what we're going to do a little later on is to do um, a, a scene which um, is going to be based on one, one colour, just like one chrome uh, painting. Um, what I thought I'd show you is how you can very easily, and you can do this yourself if you want. I don't have a photograph of this, but um, I'm going to paint a, a quick house, a quick cottage, using one colour, uh, and show how I can change that cottage into something which looks three-dimensional. Okay. Um, this is an exercise that I did quite a long time ago, but every so often I, I redo it. Here we go. Just to get practice in. So doing monochromatic tonal sketches is something, it's an exercise that's very uh, good to do. Uh, I'll do it on this one here, I think. And what I've got here is a simple cottage. If you want to, to paint along with this, that's perfectly okay, otherwise you can just look. And I'm going to use a colour which is, it's not got a particularly great tonal range, it's sort of a middling colour, it's cobalt blue. And what I'm going to do basically is, because at the moment we've got a cottage which is white against a background which is white, I'm basically going to cut the, the cottage out of the paper. Now there's um, an Australian artist, and those who have seen the CD will, see, will immediately recognise what I'm doing. Um, Terry Wade, uh, who does this, and he does this with figures with enormous effect. So I'm just going to mix up a middle tone of cobalt blue. And just shove that on, it's quite a light tone. So when we come to do our monochromatic draw, uh, painting later on, this is how we'll start. So nice and light. Um, we'll go across there as well. So it's a very, very low value turn. Same colour again, this time a little bit deeper in tone, more of a middle, middle value, so slightly stickier. Actually, it's probably a little bit too dark, isn't it?